Welcome to the first episode of our 10 weather chat and the topic today is going to be El Nino. El Nino, Cassie. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. These are a lot of fun. We're going to have a lot of fun talking about El Nino. You know, that's what's topical. A lot of folks are hearing about this El Nino. What is it? What impacts is El Nino going to have on our weather in East Tennessee this winter? A lot of different things to unpack. Thank you for joining us. We're going to have a lot of fun, kind of an informal, casual setting here. You know, continue to do what you're doing at home, and uh, hopefully you'll find this to be very informative, and you'll learn more about El Nino along the way. Because we just want to talk about topics that are, are worth talking about right now that people may want to know more about, but we just don't right. have the time when we're on TV yeah. to dedicate that <sighs> to a discussion about something that is this in-depth. Exactly. We get three minutes to do the weather and uh, on air. Uh, now we get to have a little bit more time to unpack a lot of those things that mm -hmm. El Nino will bring. And you talking about, what are some of the key words we're going to talk about? Uncertainty, yep. unpredictability, variability. So we'll kind of cover yep. all that. And an unprecedented ahead. climate setting it up in the first place. So we have a lot to talk about. Let's focus yeah. first though on what El Nino is. Yeah, exactly. El Nino, when the uh, Pacific waters are unusually and unseasonably warm, and already NOAA has declared that we are officially in a strong El Nino. We, that was the forecast, what was expected later in fall and winter. So as of about a week or two ago, we are officially in a strong El Nino. The waters are unseasonably warm, uh, much warmer than average. And if you get warm water, that's energy that rises up in the atmosphere and you get an active southern branch in the jet stream. <laughs> And therefore, shall we say, buckle up when you have a strong El Nino, especially it's going to be a very active pattern. That's what's expected. And so this is part of the El Nino Southern Oscillation. As Todd mentioned, the warming of the central and eastern right. equatorial Pacific waters. Well the said. opposite to that is La Nina, right. which is when the waters are cooler than average. That's El Nino's little sister. It's the little sister. Just teasing. And she's a real pain sometimes, too. We just dealt with her <laughs> for the last three years in a row, and yeah. now we've moved back into El Nino. And the thing about this is right. it affects, as Todd was mentioning, the jet streams, yes. which then affect our weather here across the United States. And it's it's interesting because El Nino, as he was mentioning, is about water temperatures. Right. But there's a lag between the change of the water temperatures and then the atmosphere's response to that. Exactly. So that's why we're already seeing the warm waters in the Pacific, but the atmosphere, you don't really get a response to it until usually later in winter or even during the spring months. That's when you see the most impacts from El Nino. Yeah, it, that's a great point. The waters are warming officially, but we're waiting to see those impacts. And as Cassie said, yeah, warm waters, that means energy into the atmosphere. So eventually this southern branch of the jet is going to get a lot more active. I think you hit it one more time. They have one more close oh, no, in view, but uh, uh, and then we are looking at that active branch that could bring a lot more moisture. We certainly need that being in a extreme, severe, and except exceptional drought in parts of a region. And we'll have to see how that polar jet behaves this winter. That's the thing we want to point out is that we're right in between. So we've got the polar jet that brings down the cooler air right. and then the Pacific jet that brings in some of that moisture from the Pacific Ocean dives down into Texas and pulls moisture out of the Gulf of Mexico and then brings us a more active pattern in the southern third of the lower 48. Right. But the question is, how far north does that jet stream go or how far south does the polar jet go? And that's why East Tennessee is so tricky yes. when it comes to this warmer than average temperatures here, colder than average temperatures in the Northeast and the Great Lakes, usually cooler than average temperatures in the South because of the wetter than average pattern. Right. And we are right in the middle in East Tennessee. And so that adds to the uncertainty yeah. already for what we could possibly see. Yeah, and, and Cassie, it looks like, you know, that Southern branch, that's probably going to be more the constant mm -hmm. with El Nino because as you mentioned, that warm uh, waters in the Central and, uh, and Eastern Equatorial Pacific, that Northern branch probably going to be one of the key variables that we're going to have to keep an eye on. And of course, El Nino is not the only variable. We'll talk more about that coming up in a minute. Right. So the biggest thing we want to stress here is that El Nino impacts in East Tennessee can vary significantly. We've right. had some of our wettest winters, yeah. our driest winters, our snowiest, our least snowiest, our warmest, our coolest. All of that has happened in some form of an extreme during El Nino years. Yeah, well, wait, that covers it. So we're going to see uh, everything one or all of that. I mean, each week can be a different season and we're not just saying that mm -hmm. it literally you can have these large swings from week to week and certainly from month to month in a strong El Nino. So that's the difficulty when we come to El Nino is we're not sure what we're going to have, right. but whatever we have, we're going to probably have a lot of it. So <laughs> that's, that's going to be the trick great, as we go point. along. It's going to be warm. It can be really warm. If it's going to be cold, it can be really cold. Yeah, snowy, rainy, 
hopefully we'll get the rainy and try to we get out of the drought. We'll that talk so more bad. about that coming up. Yeah. So the last three years, as we mentioned, have been La Nina years. I, th I think that's one of the first that's times right. we've had a triple dip La Nina going yeah. on there. This year is now considered a strong El Nino by the criteria of those water temperatures in the Pacific, right. how far above average they are. We've just now reached that criteria and the models forecast going into December, January, February right. for that to possibly continue strengthening. We've only had three historically strong El Nino years, right? This might be the fourth, depending on how strong that actually gets. And for folks that are being like, well, when are some of those years that we've had? Yeah, the last time we had Cassie's a, got it for you. Let me just tap into that right there. The last time we had one of those historically strong El Nino's was 2015 and 16. That was like the strongest El Nino on record. OK, wild years. Yes. Then you go back to 2009, 2010. That was a just a strong, not a historically strong. It's not one of the top three. Just a regular strong. A regular strong. Yeah. And that year. It's like year, coffee, just like regular, not real bold and strong, just a regular. Strong. No, just a medium roast. Yeah, medium. It's a medium roast, roast medium, coffee, yeah. and it uh, did not end up producing anything particularly intense with the snowfall, but right. for the cold. That was the big deal in 2009 and 2010, but that wasn't necessarily because of El Nino. That was because of the stuff going on in the Atlantic Ocean, the Arctic Oscillation, and the North or the Arctic Oscillation and the North Atlantic Oscillation. Yeah, and I know which we'll, we'll talk, talk more about more about that. You know, in, in no pun intended, Crazy. perhaps pun intended, but we're literally moving into uncharted waters because of the strong El Nino. It really, ha I mean, we we have some past you know records and looking at analogs. See, as you just said, cast some of those past years. But uh, this is going to be what we're all talking about. Boy, it's going to be fascinating and interesting to see how things play out. Because we're <laughs> all looking at this like, wow, you c it could go either way with precipitation, rain, snow, uh, warm, cold, or a little bit of all of that at different times of the winter. So when we say buckle up and stay tuned from one week to the next, literally, because it is expected to bring us a lot of variability. And we are just as sitting on the edge of our seats as you are at home to know what's going to happen this winter yep. because there's a lot of uncertainty. But when we yep. look back at past years, I went back and looked at some of the different categories of the historically strong, strong or moderate El Ninos. Right. And they are all over the place. I showed him Todd and he was like, see well, her notes. I mean, just a whole pages page of notes. Yeah, but exactly. the whole thing is what I looked up. There's absolutely no consistency <laughs> from one to the next, but there is some correlation right. to above average snowfall particularly in the mountains okay. when we come to El Nino's. And that's yeah. because of that polar branch or southern branch, Pacific right. branch of the jet stream that we showed you on the bottom of the screen there. Right. With that being the active pattern, if there is cold air in place, right. which there can be, and that system kind of rides up from the south through yep. Georgia and then through the Carolinas, it can wrap moisture around, which tends to bring more snowfall to our eastern areas and upper east Tennessee. So maybe when right. we talk about the horseshoe, right. When we're talking about those above average snowfall totals, they're most likely to happen in East Far East Tennessee mountains, right. not on the plateau this time. But that doesn't mean that we won't have snow. Yeah, exactly. It comes down to the track. Yep. We talked about that in our winter weather outlook. You know, mm -hmm. that southern slider, that low along the Gulf. If the track is just right, you have colder in place. Exactly. That's when we get our biggest snowfalls. You want to see that red L somewhere around Louisiana, et cetera. Yeah. So, all right, Kat, so you're talking about strong, somewhat of a correlation to above average snowfall in but past only, years. But four of the top 10. Right. So only 40% of the top 10 snowfall years, winter seasons, have been during an El Nino. The other six were during neutral or La Nina years. So there's not a huge correlation with that. Okay. There is a much stronger trend, though, for cooler than average temperatures. Eight of the top 10 coolest winters on record yeah. have come during El Nino years. So that kind of get, you, you made a great point, and, and there's a number of ways to see that, right? Mm -hmm. You can get the polar branch taking a big, the polar vortex coming on down, big mm -hmm. dip or something like that. Yeah, clouds precipitation, if you have more frequent systems coming in, by default, that will keep you a little cooler than average, yep. et cetera. So there's a number of ways to get to that point. All right, so here we go with some of the real factors. Okay. Once you move into winter Adding season. Adding to the uncertainty. Yeah. That's what I want, want you to get from this, because these right. are the factors that are throwing a wrench in our ability to say, here's the trend for the year. The Arctic Oscillation and the North Atlantic Oscillation. Right. Basically, what we have going on are two different pressure systems. Right. An Azores high and then right. the low pressure up over the poles. And the pressure difference between those two determines how fast the jet stream moves. Right. So if there's right. a strong pressure difference, the jet streams move in quick, and that keeps yeah. a lot of the systems along the northern tier of the lower 48. Yeah. Keeps the cold air up there, and everybody's fine. Kind of like an interstate, everything's moving along smoothly. Yes. Nothing's buckling up or stalling no. out, anything like that. Da da da. But yeah. 
<laughs> when we have less of a pressure gradient, when that right. high weakens or that low uh, weakens, right. what that does is it slows down the jet stream and then the jet stream's gonna take its time. It's gonna yes. go where it wants to go, which a <laughs> lot of times right. ends up with a big dip in the eastern half of the U.S., which allows the polar air to come pouring down right. into East Tennessee. But these two yeah. are only able to be forecast about 10 to 14 days in advance. Exactly. These are the two, though, that play the biggest role yeah. on our weather in East Tennessee. Right, exactly. So, real quick, uh, any snow lovers out there? Oh, I, I can see a bunch of people. I right. see a bunch can of hands going. Look going. at them, Cassie. Yeah. Look at them. They're raising their hands. They're going like this. Ooh, ooh, meet me. <laughs> All right, so you want, as Cassie just pointed out, you want things to slow down and start buckling and not being moved along so smooth. You want the NAO to go negative. Negative. Negative you want is to go the cold. negative, and things are going to start blocking and built and buckling and stalling out in the eastern U.S. in a negative NAO. That's one of the things goes ding, ding, ding. As Cassie said, 10 to 14 days out, we look at that and we go, hmm, in a couple <laughs> oh weeks, <boy. laughs> we could be seeing some colder air. Then it's just a matter if you get that system in the Gulf, for example, coming up, meeting the cold air. That's when you get your big snow. Because you got to have two things to have snow. Right. You got to have cold air and moisture in the same place at the same time, which is right. tricky for us to get that to happen in East Tennessee. Right. Adding into the uncertainty here. More now, this uncertainty, is, Cass. This is where we go into the unprecedented side. So here's yeah. the timeline issue, only forecastable about 10 to 14 days out. Right. Here's the setup issue record warm global sea surface temperatures right. and extreme drought. So the record warm global sea surface temperatures right. mean that. We are in unprecedented times when we talk about the big picture of how El Nino is going to affect an atmosphere right. that is different than we've ever had. So our computer models right. aren't able to do a really great job because they don't have anywhere to start from. Yeah, that's a great point. There's not really, you, you look at analogs of previous years, similar conditions and say, okay, well, this year, like you said, 2015, it did this. But literally uncharted waters of this is more of a very strong one. And great point, Cass, record warm global sea surface temps. Keep in mind, warm water, warm air is energy into the atmosphere. And so that's why we could have these large undulations of the jet stream, very active pattern, extreme drought conditions. That's where we are right now. I hope if nothing else this winter, mm -hmm. I'm hoping this strong El Nino. Now we may have to take flooding to get out of a drought sometimes, but hopefully we see whoosh, the spigot coming back on and we can get out of our extreme drought conditions. Which, if you look at the averages, the rainfall averages go up for the end of November, and right. then our wettest right. months of the year are December, January, February, and into the spring. So, right. hopefully, we will start to see some rain just because that's how things are supposed to go. Right. And maybe we'll get enough to start to make up some of that drought. Right. So, to summarize, which, oh, let me go back to the drought here real quick. Yeah. When you have that extremely dry ground, right. you're already at a deficit, and then that can add to drier air conditions as well That's a great point. Um, because there's nothing to evaporate from the ground to add moisture into the atmosphere and so it's That's right you've always said this hot and dry begets more hot and dry in this case it could be cold and dry but either way that dry is the reason that we're also concerned about how el nino may affect east tennessee too because the drought condition you've seen it on all the models rain yep. chances seven days out exactly and then they just fade you said that word, that's exactly right, baguettes. That's exactly what's going on. Models have been showing some systems come through and then they weaken. And that, what Cassie said is exactly right. Mm -hmm. Drought begets drought. It's hard, once you're in this pattern of dry soil, dry ground, dry air, it's hard to get out of. Mm -hmm. It takes strong systems yes. to change that pattern overall. Which strong systems, systems won't are, do it. And so. strong systems are more impactful. So it's yeah. not something we that's want right. to see. But it's something we need. We need that Gulf of Mexico. You say this all the time too. The Gulf of Mexico has been closed for business yeah. since September first. It's got a sign up right. It's closed for closed. business. Closed. We need it to turn that sign around turn and around. start bringing right. up some of that moisture. That's so right. to summarize here, so we can wrap this up for you. Right. Lots of uncertainty going into the winter season with this El Nino because yeah. of the unprecedented climate conditions that we're seeing right. coming into this El Nino and just how tricky it can be because of Tennessee being located right in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Then you throw it. That's exactly right. Geography. Then you throw in geography, our topography in East Tennessee, the plateau, the valley, the mountains. That, let alone, no matter El Nino, La Nina, or anywhere in between, makes East Tennessee winters predict, as you already know, right, uh, tricky, especially here in the valley, because temperatures have to be just right. So, uh, I mean, we're, we're excited to see what unfolds yep. this, meteorologically, because we've never really been quite in this scenario. 
So it's going to be fascinating to be able to look back. And, you know, we're going to do these from time to time, Cass. I think this yeah. is a great idea to have these type chats. And we'll keep folks updated, obviously, as we head into the winter. And then maybe once we get past winter and spring, we'll, we'll do it again. We'll look back. Mm -hmm. We'll say, here's what happened. And uh, we'll kind of like, wrap whoa, it up. That was a wild ride. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. Look Just back at that. Hang right? on. Hang on. Yeah, because I mean, the, the main thing is to get prepared for a winter like this. Right. I mean, you should prepare no matter what coming right. into the winter season. But Brandon Wasilewski at the National Weather Service in well Morristown. Well said, last name, by the way. Thank you, I practiced. Yeah. Um, he's basically said you need to be prepared for anything and everything going into this winter season. Yeah. So, you know, just we're going to take it week by week as we go along. We'll keep you updated. Right. But that means you really need to check back for updates because yeah. this can change a lot from week to week. Absolutely. And we're going to be transparent with you folks. We love to be honest, tell you exactly up front. Here's exactly what we think is transparent. And when we say uncertainty and unprecedented, yeah, I mean, it's going to be fascinating to see how things play out. So we're going to do our best to keep you updated throughout the fall, winter, and spring as El Nino continues to kick in. That's right. So thanks so much for joining us and uh, tune into WBIR for the latest forecast.